back in June, way back in June, it feels like, I began a kind of quasi-sermon series on the state of the church and the fate of the church, exploring scripture alongside our church's mission statement. If you want to see that mission statement, we have it printed on the back side of the bulletin. We also have copies in back. This is interspersed with some really wonderful guest preachers while I'm away. Jim Schimmel last week and Carrie Colleen next week, which I appreciate. Now you might not remember because I had a hard time remembering, but way back on June 16, I talked about the first line of our mission statement and I set it alongside Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, and I made the case that the church should be, and I think our church is, a place of teaching and empowerment. That it's not about a, 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 the pastor being the person who has all the wisdom and all the knowledge and all the skills, but it's about um, equipping one another for the work of ministry in the world. I also maintain that uh, this is not a one-time deal, a one-stop shopping trip. You don't come to church one day and suddenly you've got all the gifts you need to go out and do ministry. That it's a lifelong journey. Every one of us is being equipped and refining our skills as the days and weeks and years go on. Then on June 23rd, looking at the next section of our mission statement, alongside Micah 6, 6 through 8, I made the case that our church would do well in pleasing God, in giving God great joy, if in addition to this wonderful hour and a half of worship on Sundays, that we would also be just as intentional out in the world, doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with our God. That what we do here ought to inform and empower what we do out there. Now today we come to the third section of our mission statement, infamously known as the list. You heard Brian read that as part of the call to worship today. If you're like me, you always take a deep breath we wish to serve folks regardless of, and you kind of want to get your finger up there and start going through the list. I've chosen today to pair the list alongside 1 Corinthians 12, because I think talking about the diversity of God's creation and God's church, along with talking about the diversity of gifts we need, to empower the Spirit to do its wild and wonderful work in the world will help us appreciate both more. So having this list of all the differences of the rich diversity of our church and world alongside the rich diversity of, of gifts and talents that the Holy Spirit gives us makes each of them work just a little bit better. But I want to begin with a bold affirmation. I'll say this twice so that we all get it. I believe it is God's intention that creation be richly diverse and that we human beings are charged with stewardship of this earth and thus must maintain, nurture, and develop that diversity. Hear what I'm saying? I believe it is God's intention, meaning it's not an afterthought, or it's not icing on the cake, or it's not kind of fluff, but it is God's foundational intention that our creation be richly diverse. And that those of us who, from the moment we step foot in the garden, were charged with taking care of this earth, therefore are charged with maintaining diversity, nurturing diversity, enriching it, enhancing it, that that is one of the fundamental jobs of a human being. From the very first descriptions of creation, we see God diversifying everything, from separating the, the light from the dark, 
uh, from sin and it's separating the, the earth from the, the, the water, from separating the sky from the earth, from the ground. Even the creatures, they walk on land. They swim in the sea. They fly in the air. Some have two feet. Some have four. Some have lots of fur. Some have fins. Some have um, whiskers. Some don't. God even goes as far as giving the earth creature the honor and privilege of naming this rich diversity of wildlife and fauna and geography. I encourage you to find Carrie Newcomer's song, A Crash of Rhinoceros, to hear one of the most fun explanations. Just as a side note, she says, if Adam got the joy of naming the animals, Eve got the joy of naming what we call a group of animals, which is where we get a crash of rhinoceros. Did you know that? So it's very funny, very, very funny song. I encourage you to find it. In the words of the King James Version of the Bible, the earth creature, meaning you and me and all of us, the earth creature was put in the garden to dress and to keep it. Very Elizabethan kind of language, to dress and to keep it. Throughout all of scripture, there is a clear and distinct bias towards variety, multiplicity, and assortment in the divine scheme of things. God did not want to be bored, so God made lots of different things and expects us to take care of it. And even when we human beings mess things up by trying to take that dominion part of that first scripture, you know, go and have dominion over all things. When we take that part of the equation too seriously and begin to think a little bit too much of ourselves, maybe even think of ourselves as gods, that we don't just get to name these things, but we actually maybe created them. God reminds us in sometimes gently and sometimes not so gently ways that we are never authors of creation. We are just keepers of it. When our hubris makes us think that we literally can build a tower to heaven, God comes along and like a, a Jenga game gone wild, scattered us, scatters us to the ends of the earth and on top of it gives us different languages. In the meantime, when we, the people of God, begin to think being a chosen people is something for pride and elitism, God reminds us that being a house of prayer for all people is about faithfulness and righteousness, not about our ability to procreate, nor our nationality. When we become fearful and afraid of the powers of the world, when they seek out and succeed in crucifying those who are holiest among us, we are given at Pentecost both voice and hearing to enrich and, and, and build a bridge over that diversity that might otherwise keep us apart. And when the Holy Spirit began to call people who do not act like us, who do not talk like us, who do not think like us or even smell like us, we are reminded sometimes in wild dreams and visions that what God has made clean, we shall not call profane. So even when we don't get this diversity thing and our care and nurture of it, God has a way of guiding us back on track, helping to make sure that we know it's our job to make this diversity thing work. And here, in 1 Corinthians 12 and elsewhere, Paul reminds us that this community, which he so eloquently images as the body of Christ, this body was never meant to be homogeneous, but heterogeneous.
homogeneous and diverse. Comparing gifts and talents, skills and graces used to help others and build up the body to parts of the body with which I hope all of us have some acquaintance. Have you been acquainted with the parts of your body lately? The older I get, the more acquainted I get with the parts of my body. He reminds us that we need it all. Even the tonsils and appendix, which are appendices, or appendici, appendiso, appendisu, appendixes. Even those that we don't even know why they're there. God says we need all these parts of the body. And furthermore, we aren't just supposed to put up with them. We need to honor them and encourage them. All the unique and different gifts each and one of us, each one of us has. So, the challenge is to nurture and develop this rich diversity to which the divine is so clearly committed in ways that make the most for our time and our place. So, one of the things we do is we make lists. When we were expanding our mission statement back in 2008, was that about what it was, Sharon, 2008, when we went through that? We discussed the virtues and limitations of making a list. We were well aware then, as you are now, that no list will encompass the full diversity and spectrum of folks that will be included in this congregation. In the same way that the list of gifts that Paul lists in 1 Corinthians 12 aren't all the gifts needed to run the body of Christ. If you look at that list, it's a mighty small list. Boy, our new visioning team who's working on creating a gifts and skills inventory and retreat sure would love it if those were the only gifts we need to worry about. Five gifts, check off which ones you've got. There, that was easy. We know there's hundreds of gifts and skills and talents that you all have. And we want to explore and help you explore all of those. Well, back in 2008, we knew that this list was not going to be exhaustive. So we talked about why have a list anyway? Well, experience proves several things. First, there will always be those in a particular time and a particular place in history who are being left out, who are being ignored, who are being oppressed, dare I say, and those who are being underserved. And by naming those who in this moment are least among us, at least in the words that Jesus used, we can more certainly serve them. 150 years ago, we would have put at the top of the list, slave and free. Praise God, we don't have to do that now. 50 years ago, we would have been talking about biracial couples. That would have been controversial, but thank God that's... Oh, okay, maybe that one still needs to be talked about a little bit more. But anyway, you understand my point. Lists help us to focus on the needs of the moment. So two, without naming people in a list that you need to be intentional about including in your community, there's no real oomph, no kick in the butt, no real impetus for doing the work of inclusion. To proclaim everybody is welcome usually means nobody is welcome. Ask someone who's gone to a church where that has been their theme and they have not felt welcome at all. But what research has shown is that when congregations get specific about who is included, people take it seriously, even if that might not be specifically listed on the list. They see that the, the church is trying to be inclusive and honest and intentional. So lists keep us accountable. And finally, lists were never meant to be carved in stone. Maybe the Ten Commandments, but that was the last list meant to be carved in stone. <laughs> Needs, understanding, situations change. Already since we put that list in, 
we've begun to talk more and more about gender identity, which is very important for our trans folks and our gender neutral folks. Also, there's a movement afoot. If you haven't heard it, I've been hearing some wonderful uh, rumblings about this congregation becoming more intentional about being committed to the environment and sustainability. There's a whole program called the Green Chalice Congregation Program that we're going to be hearing more about in the coming year. Lists provide a means of measurement for how we're doing now and helping us to begin to look about where we should go next. That's why we use lists. The call to be a diverse congregation in the midst of a diverse neighborhood, enveloped on a diverse planet, is a tall order. In contrast to God's created order, which just seems to kind of naturally happen, diversity in community doesn't just happen. It has to be nurtured intentionally and constantly. Just this past week, I was both pleasantly and uncomfortably reminded about how diversity needs to be nurtured. I was at the Chautauqua Institute, which is this amazing program that's been going for over a hundred years that's all about bringing people together to hear some of the, the great ideas of the world, to hear some of the greatest preaching of the world, uh, and to be in a safe place where you can talk about those ideas and ponder them and they have arts and culture and all kinds of wonderful things happening. The topic of this last week was the next greatest generation. And every main presenter was under the age of 40. The folks in front of us were incredibly diverse. From the preacher, the Reverend Otis Moss III of Trinity's United Church of uh, uh, Chicago's uh, Trinity United Church of Christ, and the amazing choir that came from that church, to Muslim and Jewish, mainline Protestant, Christian, Evangelical Christian, and even humanist speakers. We had a military person. We had religious folks, business folks, people from the media. We had young presenters middle-aged presenters later in the day, and even a few older folks who got up and talked. But as, and, and, and they were from all around the world. But as diverse as the leaders were, the painful part was the audience was not. It was unquestionably and um, strikingly white, wealthy, Protestant, and progressive. The disconnect between those in front talking to us and their rich diversity and the people sitting around me was striking. Hear me, not bad, just not what I think was optimum. What we have here at Franklin Circle Christian Church is precious, where folks who are in leadership and folks who are in the pews kind of reflect one another. Our leadership is growing more and more diverse every year we go. The diversity nurtured over the last few generations, long before I was here, which has bloomed recently, is only a start. And I know that makes us tired to hear, but it is only a start. As challenging as diversity that we already have is, there are still those who do not feel comfortable here. Just last week, I learned from Ted, someone who left our congregation in tears, feeling she was not welcome here. I don't know the whole story, but all I have to hear is someone left feeling lonely for me to know there is more work to be done. As hard as it may feel to manage the rich variety of folks we have in our midst, we simply must move beyond being welcoming and even equipping people to be diverse, but to doing those things that truly show our deep commitment to diversity, advocating for the rights and the presence of everyone in our community. One of the key learnings I came away from, from the lecturers at Chautauqua, was that at least those that presented the next greatest generation will have nothing to do with territorial attitudes. This is what I do. This is my space. 
stay out. They are all about collaboration and sharing and learning from one another. And if I can do and say something that helps you to grow, then praise be to God. Maybe you will offer something to help me to grow and expand. They also will have nothing to do with homogeneous, all one-way communities. They are literally in conversation with people around the world of multiple languages from every religious tradition under the sun. And they are still all about sharing and learning and growing and collaborating. They are all about this transparency, this shared wisdom, this diversity, unambiguous, unapologetic, unfettered diversity. We should, and we do, celebrate the diversity we've already got here at Franklin Circle. But a good next step is to begin to listen a little more to one another. Discover where each other's hurts and sorrows are. To be willing to hear the angers and the injustices that others feel. To learn of one another's growing edges and the dreams we have. And then to try and find a way for that to be made real in this community. For us to meet those needs uh, and, and try and reach those dreams here in this church and in this neighborhood. We should support, advocate for, and empower one another to be out in the community showing the world that through the will of the love of, through the will of the Creator, through the love of Christ, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, our diversity is not just a label nor a list, but a guide to help us to change the world to make it safe and supportive place for all God's children. And in the words attributed to Mahatma Gandhi, we must be the change we wish to see in the world. May that be real here at this church. Amen and amen.